everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your participation in these webinars and we really um, appreciate your feedback. And this is going to be an ongoing webinar series as always with Freshwater Aquaculture. It's not always on a given date, but we are trying to um, continue to keep it going. And if you give us feedback on what topics and what information you'd like to hear about, I can help and find um, speakers on those topics. Okay, so we have a couple things that are going on within the COP. We did just launch the um, article that corresponds to this webinar. And um, so you can go for that for more information and links to um, more information and videos. And um, to find out more information about the things going on in the freshwater aquaculture COP, you can go and like our um, Facebook page. That's where we do a lot of announcements, um, as well as for those of you who are with universities, if you have information and stuff that you can contribute, you are more than welcome to become a member of the group. And we also have a YouTube channel. I believe that is where these recordings are going to be going up to, as to now, so you can subscribe to that to get the updated recordings of these permit and, and workshops and webinars. We have the Ask an Expert feature. If you go to askanextension.org, you can type in a question um, and it can go to any um, expert in the field, and those usually get answered within 20 to 48 hours. Um, and then there is also the webinar series, learn.extension.org. If you follow that, you will um, get all the updates and all the webinars going on through eExtension, not just the Freshwater Aquaculture COP. And I will be putting these links up in the chat. Um, you ready to put up Ben's? So I will stop sharing. Mark, you want to go ahead and share Ben's? Or? Well, Ben, I think Ben's going to share from his screen. Right. And I'll do a quick introduction while he's doing that. Ben um, comes to us from the University of Arizona. He started out at the University of Colorado in UC Davis. He works entirely in the field of children, obesity, and diabetics. But while he was doing some research, he also noticed some interesting and results in data that pertain to fish and that can mean greatly benefit the fish and aquaculture industry. So Ben, without further ado, it's all you. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Um, if you guys have any questions along the way, go ahead and type them into the Q&A and I'll try and answer them as we go along um, and make this more of a discussion than a straight up lecture. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about stuff we've done in tilapia uh, oysters and then very minimally in uh, shrimp. But what we think we've developed here is a tool that can help uh, producers um, identify f uh, fish or oysters that are superior for growth. Before I get started, I need to thank a number of people and it's always better to do this, I think, at the beginning because at the end of the talk, uh, people have zoned out. Uh, Chris Langdon and Blaine Schofield, who works in his lab at Hatfield Marine Science Center, have been essential for all the oyster work we've done. Kevin Fitzsimmons has aided us in our tilapia work. And Ken Overturf, I'm going to present a couple of data slides that he put together uh, in trout. Uh, I've got the members of the people in my lab, which uh, the main member who's worked on this is Kyle Kench. Um, but a number of other people have worked on it, and we've got a number of undergrads who are essential to this research as well. Uh, we've got our extension specialists, uh, both Gary Freetag and Vanessa, have been involved with this. And then the industry partners without whom we couldn't do any of this uh, have been Desert Springs Tilapia and Tark Rush there, and then Provon Crump and Roberto Quintana at Goose Point and Hawaiian Shellfish uh, LLC, respectively. And then finally, our funding, which is uh, through two sources, the Western Regional Aquaculture Center and a USDA NEFA Special Research Aquaculture Award. So the real issue, um, as I see it, uh, for aquaculturalists, and I'm not an aquaculturalist, but I've gained a good appreciation for what's happening uh, in aquaculture as I've done this research, is that selecting fish that grow quickly isn't necessarily identifying the fish that are genetically superior for growth. In fact, what you're most frequently selecting are the fish that get the most feed. And so you may be selecting for phagic drive or you may be selecting for aggression. And those two may not be separate. Um, we've all heard recently the term hangry, a uh, combination of hungry and angry. And uh, there's a lot of problems associated uh, with aggression in fish. 
fish waste energy defending territory. They, uh, the smaller fish spend energy avoiding aggressive fish. You have increased morbidity and mortality, and you have heterogeneity of growth within a tank where you have some very large fish and some very small fish. Um, and we've seen that both on the farm and in our small culture systems. But the industry does demand faster growing fish. And that can be seen through what Aqua Bounty has put into their uh, growth hormone over expressing salmon and into what the USDA is funding right now, which um, one example of, of that research is uh, from my old postdoc lab, where they're trying to develop a catfish that has uh, a mutation in the wine cord four receptor and therefore is hungry all the time. Uh, the idea being that mutating the melanocortin-4 receptor uh, would be more palatable to the public than growth hormone overexpression because it's not a hormone manipulation. But the consumer, I would argue, um, has a major problem with uh, these products. Uh, they don't want growth, they want, don't want GMO uh, plants, but they really don't want GMO animals. And in line with the consumer's unwillingness to accept this product, all of these retailers have said they won't carry the growth hormone over expressing salmon. And the reason they have to say that is, is in part because uh, the consumer won't accept it, but also in part because uh, the store needs to maintain uh, sales of other products uh, within their store. And if they had growth hormone salmon uh, next to regular salmon, the fear would be that, that people would um, possibly accidentally grab the uh, growth hormone over expressing salmon and, and GMO salmon, and that's just not something that the public's willing to accept. So our options to improve genetics are primarily limited to selective breeding. And selective breeding at the beginning uh, seemed to have some major issues uh, where mass selection for growth in Nile tilapia resulted in no improvement. So when they selected the largest tilapia and bred those, they didn't at all improve uh, growth. Now that that's improved quite a bit. We actually are able to select for growth now. However, the heritability remains fairly low and uh, it's quite difficult still to select fish for growth. And here's one example of a group in France that selected uh, brown trout for growth, and they were actually very effective. They got a 21% increase um, in growth per year, but that was that came at a cost or a difficulty. They had to have a high number of breeders from which to select. They needed to select uh, for in a group that had low non-genetic influences on growth. So they had to have a system that completely limited the eliminated the effects of aggression, eliminated the uh, effects of feed availability, and uh, was very uh, responsive to only genetic effects, and then they needed to perform repeated growth challenges. So this isn't something that a producer could normally just pick up and do on their own. It requires a great deal of effort to select for those fish that are going to grow the most quickly. And in, especially in the tilapia industry, where a lot of people uh, raise their own brood stock, this would be quite difficult. So I'm going to take you to the very basics of energy expenditure and talk about how it works and how that can be translated from a pile of wood to a fish. If we look at oxygen consumption, um, Oxygen is up here. It, it, when wood's around and wood starts on fire and oxygen is present, uh, we get a fire and when we have that fire, what is produced is carbon dioxide and heat. And that's, this is no different from what you and I do with food. What we do is we consume food, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2, and we produce body heat. Well, in a fish, We've got that same thing. We've got oxygen plus a carbon fuel, which is the uh, pelleted feed, and the fish eats that, and the fish produces CO2. Now the fish is a cold blood organism, so it doesn't produce a lot of heat, but it does produce some heat, and it uses some of that dietary energy for maintenance. 
So maintaining cell membrane potentials and, and turning over uh, DNA and protein and cells within the body. But a good deal of that dietary energy goes to growth. And so if we uh, were to move forward and identify fish that had a higher oxygen consumption, those fish would have increased CO2 release, but they'd have a small increase in maintenance and heat requirements, but a dramatic increase in growth. And in fact, 34% of oxygen consumption in red drum larvae has been shown to be directly tied to uh, protein accretion, which is protein uh, building or muscle mass building, and so growth. Going further into the link between energy expenditure and growth, uh, I've got a first uh, slide here from a paper showing that body mass was directly tied to oxygen consumption, and that's across fish species. Uh, the more body mass you have, the more oxygen you consume because uh, you've got more cells and more body. But there are animals that have uh, energy consumption above this line. And so these animals with an energy consumption above this line are expending energy at a higher level for their body weight. And there's another group that, of fish that does that. And I'm taking you back to the growth hormone overexpressing salmon because I think it's a beautiful model for uh, fast growth. And if we look here on the right panel, we have the, um, in the triangles, We've got the oxygen consumption on the y-axis and the fish weight on the x-axis. And you can see that oxygen consumption is fairly high um, relative to fish weight when you compare it to the dark circles, which are the non-transgenic fish on the opposite side. So at the same body weight, growth hormone overexpressing salmon, which are growing more quickly, expend more energy than non-growth hormone overexpressing fish. Well, let's take that principle forward. If we were to measure the metabolic rate of an embryonic fish, would we be able to predict growth? That was the question we set out with. And with embryonic fish, we avoid some big issues that we've seen in previous studies associated with uh, connecting metabolic rate to, to growth. One is almost all of our animals are gonna have the same body size. So they'll be about the same size. They won't be eating anything. They will have zero food intake because they'll still be feeding on the yolk. And they'll have very, very low activity um, because they are embryos. And also we put them in a, a very small uh, volume of water for this measure. Because activity could increase energy expenditure, that lack of activity is beneficial. There is one potential problem. There are, is the potential for maternal effects. And that, that can be an issue. Um, but I think you'll see that that's less of an issue than previous studies may have proposed that it might be. We also get the added benefit it, by selecting fish with a high metabolic rate or a low metabolic rate as uh, embryos, we don't have to invest in those fish beyond um, those first few days of life. And so we, we limit our, our investment in these animals. So the principle of the assay I developed is that as you metabolize, or as a fish metabolizes, glucose, lipid, and protein, they produce a compound called NADH2. And what we did is we incubated our fish with a compound called resazurin. Its trademark name is Alamar Blue. It's commercially available. When the Alamar Blue reacts with the NADH2, it gets reduced. And when it gets reduced, meaning we added two hydrogens to it, it becomes fluorescent and it changes color. It actually changes color from blue to pink. And you can see that here. In A, we've got three zebrafish in a well, and these three zebrafish were exposed to Alamar blue uh, just immediately. We haven't allowed them to incubate with the Alamar blue. So we took the picture immediately after um, putting them in the well. In B, we took the picture 24 hours later. And you can see that we've got now a nice pink color um, associated with this and these fish are uh, that that's indicative that these fish had a metabolic rate that was measurable in response to being incubated uh, with the Alamar blue. 
how does LMR blue compare to oxygen consumption? Because oxygen consumption is the gold standard for measuring metabolic rate of an animal. If we look at LMR blue, we can see that the signal generated increases across time from 2 to 12 to 24 hours. When we use an open air oxygen consumption system, which is the only method that would be able to be used on a number of fish, we can see that oxygen consumption uh, can be measured for the first two hours, after which oxygen consumption levels off um, and the exchange of gas with the air, between the air and the water uh, equilibrates. So we wanted to compare oxygen consumption measured during these first two hours to our signal in Alamar Blue. And if we look at that, we can see that the change in fluorescence associated with Alamar Blue is directly related to the change in fluorescence associated with this oxygen consumption assay that's commercially available. So our assay seems to uh, perform well in comparison to the oxygen consumption assay, but we have some advantages. Uh, we don't have to invest in equipment. So we can move forward without uh, having a huge amount of equipment. In fact, these BD biosensor plates cost about $100 a piece, and the assay I'm describing to you costs about uh, one cent per fish uh, at the most. The assay can be performed in eggs. Uh, so it's a cumulative signal. Because of the accumulation of the signal, uh, we can measure a small metabolic rate, and by allowing that signal to accumulate across time, we can see uh, a large difference. And then we have the opportunity to measure energy expenditure in thousands of fish per day. Uh, within my lab, we'll measure energy expenditure uh, with about, on about 2,500 fish per person per day. I'm going to take you back to that picture I showed you at first where we had uh, three fish and you can see they changed the color. What we did subsequently was we plated fish into a 96 well plate and I've got an example of a 96 well plate here. It's about three inches by five inches um, in size and has 96 individual wells where you can have uh, one fish per well and you can measure the metabolic rate then of that fish individually. When we took the fish that had the highest metabolic rate and we reared them separately from the fish that had the lowest metabolic rate, and those are the top and bottom quartiles, uh, so the top 26, 24 fish and the bottom 24 fish, and we reared those up. Uh, at one month, we can see that body length was higher in those fish that had a high metabolic rate than in fish that had a low metabolic rate. Now, zebra fish have determinate growth, uh, so we weren't able to continue these studies uh, out further, but this gave us some hope that, in fact, by measuring metabolic rate in zebrafish, we were able to predict how fast they grew. We wanted to apply this assay to tilapia, and here's just an example of a plate uh, filled with one tilapia per well, and it's that same 96 well plate, the three by five inch plate that I showed you earlier. And you can see here that we've got some fish that have an extremely high metabolic rate, this fish up here at the top that's bright pink, uh, we've got other fish with a fairly high metabolic rate. Those are in purple. And then we've got some fish that just have a very low metabolic rate. Uh, that's in blue. And so we're able to segregate fish that produce a lot of NADH2 from fish that produce very little NADH2. When we looked at this assay in tilapia and looked across time, we can see that as time increased, so did the number of uh, so did the amount of signal we generated. So one tilapia would generate some signal at four hours, more at 15, and yet more at 24. And if we compared the num how many fish we put in a well, then we had to use a bigger plate, a bigger well plate for this, um, because we were gonna put more than one fish per well. But when we put in more fish within a well, we had a higher metabolic rate in that well. And that's a very simple test. Uh, to make sure that you are able to measure a change in metabolic rate just by increasing the number of animals, we increase the metabolic rate within that set volume. Now, Ken Overturf did some nice work for us uh, and for uh, a project we're working on together in trout and showed that uh, one trout egg was able to induce a increase in fluorescent signal that was well above that seen in baseline over here on the on the uh, left, and that as he increased the number of trout eggs per well, the signal increased. Now he used a much higher concentration of LMR blue than what you've seen from my studies, and that's uh, just a factor of 
we're working to make sure the cost is minimized so that this can be used in production aquaculture. Um, but you can see here, if he's got zero uh, eggs in the well, the top two wells over here on the upper left-hand corner, um, the water stayed blue. And as he increased the number of eggs from one to two to three to four to five, we got a further increase in color change from blue to pink. And so uh, this assay is working to measure metabolic rate um, increases associated with increasing the number of trout eggs per well. Now that's great, but the real key is, does it predict the growth? And we'd shown an increase in growth um, in our uh, zebrafish studies, and we needed to replicate that in the tilapia studies. And to do that, we worked with Tark Rush at Desert Springs Tilapia. And he told us uh, he, he, had group, he had tanks that could hold 1,500 uh, fish at a time, and he wanted the minimum group size to be that. So what we did is measured the metabolic rate in 6,000 uh, embryonic fish, and then segregated the highest 1,500 fish from the lowest 1,500 fish and reared those up. And we did that three times. Uh, with three separate groups of fish. So we had a total of 4,500 fish in each group and each one of those 40, or those 4,500 fish in each group were split into three tanks. And so we have a, a experimental unit of three. And what you can see here is that high metabolic rate fish grew more quickly than low metabolic rate fish all the way out to harvest size at nine months. So we're able to identify the fish that are growing more quickly, and this effect lasts all the way until harvest size. Um, and this 30% increase in growth uh, is amongst fish that were uh, actually siblings um, in some cases, because we would measure uh, 6,000 embryonic fish at one time, and that's just a pool of uh, eggs from multiple breeders and we were then measuring the metabolic rate. So I'm sure we've got high and low metabolic rate fish within the same clutch uh, that are making this up. And you'll remember in zebrafish, our effect was 26.7%, and here we're at 29%. So very similar uh, increases in growth as associated with segregating the upper and lower cord pile. Uh, the question was asked when we first presented this data, are we not just selecting the bigger fish at that point? And so, uh, you can see here uh, on the left, we've got our low metabolic rate fish, and on the right, we've got our high metabolic rate fish. And if we take these pictures and blow them up, we're able to identify the length of the fish and measure the length of each of these individual fish. And when we do that, you can see that we see no difference in uh, body length associated with these fish. So we don't think we're selecting bigger fish at that time. We're selecting fish that actually are more meta metabolically active. So the question is, can selection based on metabolic rate improve feed efficiency? Now, we weren't able to measure feed efficiency out at Desert Springs Tilapia. Uh, feed isn't weighed there. They use a volume measure. So we developed a system here at, at University of Arizona, and we subsequently measured feed efficiency. And when we select the high metabolic rate group, we do improve feed efficiency relative to the low metabolic rate group. And so, uh, what was shown with the improved growth was in fish that were fed the same amount of feed, um, but here we show that we actually have improved feed efficiency. Now, this is great, but you can't select every single fish on your farm. Could you select your brood stock? That's where you have the opportunity to make the most genetic uh, potential in gains. And so we first wanted to show you that there's say, sufficient variation to allow for selective improvement. And that can be seen here. If you look at the tail, the lower right-hand tail on your screen, you'll see that there's quite a number of fish that have a metabolic rate greater than or equal to two standard deviations away from the mean. So we think that by selecting these fish, you can make dramatic genetic improvements uh, in your fish fairly quickly. And in fact, we went on to compare broodstock selected by growth, which is how uh, Desert Springs tilapia uh, 
was performing their uh, broodstock selection to broodstock selection based on metabolic rate. And when we do that, if we look first, here's the broodstock selected based on growth, which were selected by TARC. And here's the broodstock we selected and then returned to him uh, based on metabolic rate. If we compare the embryos and their metabolic rate, we can see that our embryos have a much higher metabolic rate than embryos that are, select, that are derived from fish uh, broodstock that were selected for growth. And since we've also already shown that metabolic rate uh, predicts growth rate, these, these embryos are going to grow better. We went on to show that these embryos actually uh, have improved feed efficiency relative to the embryos that were selected for growth. Now the feed efficiency um, is a little lower than ideal here because the fish were being overfed, but uh, metabolic rate selected embryos did have a higher feed efficiency than growth selected embryos. At this point, all we've talked about are selecting embryos, rearing them up, using them either as broodstock or as your feed fish, um, but we needed to apply this to adults and possibly be able to select um, adults that were good for uh, broodstock. And, and this would be beneficial in wild-caught broodstock or could be beneficial uh, in um, long species that take a long time to mature, such as sturgeon, where you wouldn't want to wait eight years to find out which broodstock were the best. So the first thing we did is we took a, a clip of the caudal fin. And when we take a clip of the caudal fin and we incubate it with the Almar Blue, the signal generated or the fluorescence generated increases with time. Then if we took multiple clips and we compared them, we, we changed their mass. So we have some clips that only weigh two milligrams and others that weigh eight milligrams. You can see that as the size of the explant or the fin clip increases, so does the fluorescence. This suggested to us that this was measuring metabolic rate of the fin. We then went to our broods, our fish, that we had already selected to have a higher low metabolic rate, and we took fin clips from them. And what's surprising is those fish that had a high metabolic rate as embryos, their fin clips had a much lower metabolic rate compared to fin clips from fish that had a low metabolic rate as embryos. We, we don't have an explanation for this yet, but this does suggest to us that fin clips can be used to identify those fish that would be superior broodstock. And in fact, it would be those fish that have fin clips that have a low metabolic rate. Or, yeah, that have a low metabolic rate. At this point, we've shown you a bunch of fluorescence data and not everybody has a fluorometer or is able to measure fluorescence. You can just measure, uh, you could, if you were selecting, uh, just look at for those wells that are pink or purple. Those are obviously your uh, fish or embryos with a high metabolic rate. Alternatively, uh, you can use red, green, blue analysis where you uh, scan over the well, find a place that doesn't have a shadow, and then measure the uh, red, green, blue uh, spectrum there using uh, PowerPoint or any of those, and it will give you a, a number that is quantitative if you feel necessary. So to conclude our research in tilapia, we've got an assay that can predict growth and feed efficiency in tilapia. It can be used to identify superior broodstock, and the fin clips appear to allow us to select for uh, adults, and future work's going to move forward with that. We've also conducted some research in oysters, and I want to show you that real quickly. Uh, here's an example on the right. We've got uh, three wells that have 10,000 D larvae in them, three with five. And you can see that as we increase the number of D larvae within a well, we increase the change in color from, per, from blue to pink. You can also see that as we increase the number of oysters per well, and this was in this section here, um, couldn't find anybody willing to count uh, 10,000 oysters in, in 200 microliters or uh, didn't want to punish anybody with that task. Um, you can see we've got a linear relationship between fluorescence and the number of oysters per well. Not only can this be applied to D larvae, but we can also apply it to spat 
and you can see here um, it, as we increase the number of spat within a well from one to two to three to four to five we increase the change in fluorescence and as we go from 30 minutes to 60 minutes to 120 minutes and up to 360 minutes we have an increase in signal now the signal maxes out um, because we've run out of of the um, reagent so you need to measure this at a point where the signal is is still increasing and with uh, oyster spat that actually occurs fairly quickly now I'll show you uh, different ways to manipulate that uh, you can see also that that change in fluorescence is linear across time uh, with one two or three oysters now we know that salinity affects the metabolic rate of an oyster we also know that temperature can affect the metabolic rate of the oyster and here on the left uh, we've got three different temperatures oysters reared at 14 24 or 30 degrees these measures were taken at six hours. They were either in 10 parts per thousand uh, salt, 15 or 30 parts per thousand. And you can see 30 parts per thousand, oysters at 30 parts per thousand had a much higher metabolic rate than those at 10 or 15. You can also see that it increased with temperature metabolic rate did. And that signal at six hours uh, was significant um, for the 30, but not for the 10 and 15. But when we went out to 16 hours, it was significant at those lower salinities. And over here on the right, you can see a picture of the uh, actual plates that was taken at um, 16 hours. So down here on the bottom, we've got our plate that was maintained at 14 degrees. In the middle, the plate that was at, maintained at 24 degrees. And at the top, the plate that was maintained at 30 degrees. So the question is, can this be applied to predict growth? And to answer that question, the first thing we did was took uh, Chris Langdon's inbred and outbred lines. So he has uh, multiple inbred lines of oysters, uh, one of which is he calls Adam. And when, when you breed Adam to Adam, uh, you generate uh, fluorescence, change in fluorescence per egg of this. Uh, Eve to Eve is another inbred line, so when we breed Eve, Eve to Eve, it's further inbreeding. However, when we cross those and so do an outcross, we actually decrease the change in fluorescence per egg. Once again, suggesting that these oysters that we know are going to grow more quickly have a decreased metabolic rate um, relative to their inbred, slow-growing uh, half-sibs. We then went on to measure uh, metabolic rate within 24 families. And 24 families that were reared out at Hatfield Marine Science Center. And uh, within those families, we took, we measured the metabolic rate of 96 oysters and we took the highest 24 uh, and the lowest 24, so the upper and lower quartile. And once again, working in 96 ball plates. Um, the first thing you'll see here is that our low metabolic rate oysters had a lower survival. This has to be interpreted with some caution because oysters that were dead would have a low metabolic rate. And so it's possible that some of the oysters we were selecting to have a low metabolic rate actually were already dead. And that is uh, somewhat of an issue, but I think it's something that we can accept if we're picking out the top 3,000 oysters um, that have the lowest metabolic rate, and we have a 60% death rate uh, or a 40% death rate, we understand that, that probably most of that is due to the fact that we've, we've selected some oysters that were dead during measure. But these low metabolic rate uh, oysters do tend to grow more quickly. They have an average weight that's greater than the high metabolic rate oysters, uh, or tends to be higher than the high metabolic rate oysters, uh, after um, two months of rearing. So we reared these oysters from uh, about one and a half months of age to three and a half months of age. Um, we selected them at one and a half and, and then reared them out. And because of the increased survival, the total weight amongst our 24 oysters, which wasn't always 24 oysters at the, at the conclusion, um, actually never was 24 oysters at the conclusion of the study, uh, was greater in our high metabolic rate group. But again, I'll remind you that the average weight 
is better in our low metabolic rate group. And we believe that the survival problems um, in the low metabolic rate group might be because of selection. So together, this data suggests the same thing that the data with the inbred oysters suggests, which is that low metabolic rate oysters have improved growth. To date, people are selecting oysters based on family crosses. And what our data is telling us is that this may not be the most efficient way to move forward with genetic selection for oysters. If we can identify individuals within a family that have a high metabolic rate, those are oysters that aren't going to perform well. And you can find those oysters even in these groups that have the lowest metabolic rate. Look at family nine. It's got a fairly low metabolic rate. Actually, it's the lowest metabolic rate, I think, of the group. If we chose this oyster to be one of our brood stock, however, we wouldn't get the benefit. We wouldn't get the maximal benefit of breeding from that family. Whereas if we were able to select one of the oysters that had the lowest metabolic rate, um, then we could improve that line of oysters uh, that much more. So we think that individual selection will lead to more rapid genetic improvements than family selection. The final thing I wanna show you, and this is the last uh, data slide I've, ha I've got, is some, some data in oysters. And this is in crustacean, or data in crustaceans, this is in shrimp. Um, if we increase the number of shrimp per well or adjust it from one to five, you can see that the signal increases as the number of shrimp per well increases and as time increases. So at one hour, we have some signal at three hours more and at six hours, we have even more signal. So in conclusion, oysters, uh, for oyster work, we think we need to move beyond family breeding schemes to improve growth more quickly. If we look at individual breeding, we, uh, the value, individual values um, for metabolic rate, we can probably predict uh, the genetic potential for growth better in oysters than by doing uh, gross family screens. And then uh, future directions are to uh, look at removing aggression in fish. Once we've selected fish that have the highest genetic potential for growth, we can remove aggression uh, from fish by eliminating those fish that are growing most quickly. And in fact, we've got some preliminary data uh, doing that, which shows that our high metabolic rate, our high metabolic rate fish uh, that we've selected, they grow more quickly. When we segregate out the small growers from the fast growers, our feed efficiency is the same. It's actually higher. And if we look at application in marine fish species, and we were able to extend our findings uh, to shrimp, we're thinking a lot about the fin clip assay and extending that. And then the final thing is in warm water species like tilapia, metabolic rate is maintained at a high level because of the fact that the fish are in warm water and warm water drives metabolic rate, as we've shown with the oysters. We've also shown that with, uh, with the shrimp and, and with the tilapia. So we're thinking that this assay may even be more predictive and yield greater results for growth in those species that are reared in cold water. Once again, I wanna acknowledge all of our collaborators that have helped, everybody from the lab who's helped, um, our extension industry partners, and our funding, which is through the Western Regional Aquaculture Center and the USDA NEFA. If you have any questions that don't get answered today, I'm happy to take those. Uh, you can send me an email, feel free to call me. Once again, a video of the uh, of uh, the assay being run can be viewed on my website. And uh, if you have any interest in, in applying this assay, uh, you can get a hold of Todd McCulley at our uh, tech launch here at University of Arizona. Thank you guys very much. Okay, questions folks, come on, if not, don't, don't be shy. Feel, feel free to ask in q and I, I put a message in chat. We also have the ability to promote uh, viewers to panelists. So if you're doing research in this area, and maybe would like to share some of your own observations or would just rather talk and ask a question live rather than do it in chat or Q&A, please do it. Also, Vanessa's uh, posted a link to the uh, Aquatrix uh, survey and evaluation there. Uh, please take some time to feel, feel that out. Looks like there could be a question in, in chat. Uh, yeah, does it require a stable environment or a sterile environment to perform the test? Uh, we use a lot of antibiotics. We use uh, chloramphenicol and ampicillin. Uh, 
with our fins, we also used fungizone to eliminate any possible uh, issues there. Um, we do not do it in, in a sterile environment, but we do do it in a clean environment. Uh, we also always keep some wells empty um, to make sure we aren't generating a lot of signal um, when we don't have a, a fish in there. And in general, the signal is very minimal. Uh, the change in signal associated uh, with out a fish. So we don't think that, that that's essential, um, but obviously you, uh, the cleaner you are, the cleaner your results will be. Uh, Kevin asked, you mentioned sturgeon, could it work for early growth even if you don't wait for adulthood? Uh, we seem to, at least with tilapia, growth is uh, increased uh, during the first few months uh, immediately, so I would assume that that would be the case for, for other species. Um, we're looking forward to hopefully applying this to uh, trout and um, some marine species, so. Thank you, Philippe. This has been published in Zebrafish, the journal, um, and I know that there's actually a couple groups working with it right now using uh, insulin knockouts and other uh, zebrafish models, and they're having a lot of luck with it. So uh, I think you'll see it come out more frequently for that. Ben uh, Gibson asked a question there in Q&A. says, uh, have you seen a different effect based on tissue type on metabolic rate? So the only two tissues that we have looked at where we've measured the metabolic rate of the tissue, um, and if I'm not answering the question correctly, just go ahead and, and ask it again. Um, are we've looked at skeletal muscle biopsies and we've looked at fins and we haven't compared uh, within the same fish and that would be something that we need to do. That's a good point. Um, okay, we'll plan on taking another minute and uh, if we don't have any questions in the next minute then we'll plan on closing the webinar. No, salt water doesn't seem to affect the Alamar blue assay. Um, it worked extremely well at, at all salt concentrations uh, from 10 to 45 parts per thousand as well as in fresh water. So yeah, that's Ronald brings up, is it legal to sell adult fish if they've been exposed as babies to the fluorescent uh, a chemical? And uh, no, it wouldn't be. That's why you would have to uh, we, that would be a regulatory hurdle that we need to get past. Uh, however, if you're just using it to select your brood stock, that shouldn't be an issue at all. And that's why we've kind of progressed in that direction, um, brood stock selection. That, and we think you can make your biggest gains there in brood stock selection. And then, yeah, Gibson, uh, I think I did interpret your question correctly, and we don't have that data, and we do need to get that data where we take skeletal muscle biopsies and fin clips from the exact same fish and see if the same fish that have a, a low metabolic rate from the fin clip um, have a similarly low metabolic rate in the skeletal muscle, or what we're seeing is uh, a different uh, proportioning of energy where, because those embryos that had a high metabolic rate then had a low metabolic rate of their fin clip, are they proportioning their muscle better towards, or their energy expenditure better towards skeletal muscle for growth? And I think that's a, a great question, actually, one we've talked about in the lab a couple times. So, well, thank you guys. I really appreciate that. Um, Ternal effects. So, so there was a lot of questions um, regarding are you, when you're measuring an embryonic fish and measuring its metabolic rate, are you measuring differences uh, associated with the quality of the yolk or uh, the amount of yolk that the, the mother has given to the, the eggs? are you just measuring egg quality? Um, and there's been a lot of times where people have tried to find assays that measure egg quality, um, measuring different amounts of lipids or, or something along those lines, but anybody who's, or just the size of the egg, and uh, any of those maternal effects seem to go away during the first part of life and, and wouldn't have lasted all the way out till harvest, so we don't think maternal effects are at least they aren't the driving factor behind what we're measuring. So just again, uh, you, you, you can see uh, Ben's contact, contact information there. Um, uh, again, the recording. Uh, please share this recording with uh, 
colleagues that you think might be uh, might be interested or were not able to be here. Um, again, a, the, a recording is available of an estimate in the YouTube site, site and then also on the Learn uh, page that I just put in chat. And if there is nothing else, uh, thanks, thanks everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.